So hello everyone, um, I'm Emmanuel and I'm generally in databases and data analysis. And one of the one of the problems that I've been working on a lot recently, that's the problem of query optimization. And in this talk, I'm going to give a quick overview of my recent work in that area. But also, I'm going to talk about some other projects that I have recently done and about some ongoing projects that I'm working on for the moment. <clears throat> Now, as you are certainly aware, nowadays in business and in industry, as well as in nearly all scientific disciplines, we need to do large-scale data analysis in order to make progress. And if you want to do data analysis, then first of all, you need a language in which you can describe to the computer what type of analysis you want to perform. And for the moment, perhaps the most popular language, that's the so-called SQL language, the Structured Query Language. And one of the reasons why that language is so popular, that certainly that it is a declarative language, meaning that users describe the data they want to generate, but they don't have to describe how to generate it. And the software component inside the database system, which makes it a declarative language, that's the query optimizer, which solves the query optimization problem. I'm going to give you a more concrete example later, but on a high level, query optimization is about translating a declarative query describing data to generate into an executable query plan. And uh, for a given query, you have many choices to optimize. You can, for instance, choose the order of operations or choose the operator implementations, and those choices lead to query plans with widely different execution times. So the golden classical query optimization is to find a query plan with minimal execution time. <clears throat> now, query optimization is an NP-hard optimization problem. It's even NP-hard to find approximately optimal solutions. So this problem is very difficult to solve, but still we need to solve it because for a given query, the cost of the optimal query plan is typically by many orders of magnitude lower than the cost of an average query plan. And this is why people have invested a lot of effort into making query optimization efficient. At our main research conferences and databases, we typically have multiple tracks on query optimization and query optimizers in current database systems. They're highly complex components with millions of lines of code and uh, Companies spend millions of dollars in order to improve them. So this is a pretty important topic for us, and there has been a lot of work in that space. However, most of that work actually has referred to slight variations of the original problem model in query optimization, which was introduced in the year 79. And that problem model was motivated by the context of query optimization at that time. And in particular, from today's perspective, we would say that execution engines used at that time they were relatively simple, which means that we don't have many choices to optimize. And if you do large-scale data analysis nowadays, then you have many more choices when it comes to data processing. For instance, we can choose to use cloud computing in order to outsource computation, or you can use crowdsourcing in order to outsource human computation, or you can use approximate processing in order to trade execution time for result precision. And <clears throat> The starting point of my recently submitted thesis was basically to say that if the whole context of query optimization has changed so significantly, then it also changes the query optimization problem itself. Because first of all, we have many more choices. That means we have much more parameters to optimize. For instance, we can uh, optimize which type of resources and how many resources we rent from a cloud provider. Or we can choose the size of the samples that with which we work during approximate processing. And perhaps even more fundamentally, many of those um, data processing options that are outlined above, they, on a high level, allow you to trade between different execution cost metrics. For instance, in cloud computing, you can often trade between execution time and monetary execution fees by adapting the resources that you rent from the cloud provider. Or in approximate processing, you can trade between execution time and result precision by adapting the size of the samples you work with. <clears throat> and this means that when we compare alternative query plans, then we don't have only one metric to compare them, but we actually have 
multiple conflicting cost and quality metrics to compare alternative query plans. And as soon as we have multiple cost metrics, it also means there is no such things as an optimal plan anymore, since what is the optimal plan now can depend on user preferences. For instance, in a cloud scenario, some users might care more about execution time, while others care more about monetary execution fees. And so this means that we have to integrate user preferences into the optimization process. So yes. you mentioned that back in 79 that there was very few operators. Do you think that's changed since? What, what are some operators that we're seeing now that we weren't seeing back in 79? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, operators is one thing. I mean, here uh, I already had the operator parameter right. in classical query optimization. Those other things that I've added here, they refer to those different data processing options that you see. I mean, even if you only have a limited set of joint operators, as soon as you use cloud computing, you can actually choose which degree of parallelism to use for a specific join. Or for instance, what type of resources you rent for executing the query. You have different uh, virtual machines that you can choose from. So all those parameters add to the search space for query optimization. Very good question. And at the same time, the number of cost metrics that we have to compare different query plans is also increased. So altogether, a large search space, many conflicting cost metrics, query optimization actually becomes a harder problem. And now in the following, I'm gonna make that more concrete by showing you an example for query optimization in the context of large-scale data analysis. And this example is taken from my own experiences at uh, Google Mountain View, where I was doing a project on large-scale text mining. And during that project, I also had to tune the execution of the query that you see on top. And this query on a high level has to join, meaning to combine five large data sets. I'm not gonna go too much into detail concerning the semantics of those data sets, but at a high level, I had extracted opinions on entities from the web now I had to combine those opinions with additional information about those entities and with statistical models that would allow me to interpret those opinions. So in the end, it came down to having to join multiple large data sets. And this query was typically executed on a large cluster with thousands of nodes and execution could take up to a couple of hours. Those joins are usually executed as binary operations so in case of the example query, we could, for instance, start by joining the opinions with the entity properties and then join the result of that with the entity types and the result of that with the entities. And finally, we could join with the statistical models. Now, when estimating the execution time of that plan, it might be something around one day. So it's actually pretty bad. And perhaps the problem, part of the problem is that we have started our joins with the largest data set. And here you see that the size of the icon represents the size of the corresponding data sets. Perhaps we can improve things if we start joining with one of the smaller data sets. And this, in this simple example, it indeed reduces execution time to around four hours only. And what will become important later is that this plan and the previous plan, they both belong to the class of so-called left deep query plans meaning that the left input of each join operation is always the result of all previous joins. We don't have to do it like that. We can also formulate this plan, for instance, which is not left deep and reduces execution time further. And since this plan is not left deep, it belongs to the class of bushy query plans. <clears throat> now, so far, we've only always assumed that we process the entire input data but this is not required in all cases. So we might consider to process only 10% of the opinions and then we can reduce execution time significantly since we process less data. But uh, on the other side, we don't obtain a complete result anymore since we work with an input sample. And so we should compare alternative plans not only based on their execution time, but also based on their result precision. And in this simplistic example, let's say that the recite completeness is proportional to the input completeness. <clears throat> and now I have actually changed the relative sizes of the input data sets. And this means that perhaps the current join order is not optimal anymore. And by changing it like that, I can indeed reduce execution time to only 30 minutes. Yet another criterion that I should consider is probably the number of compute hours that I consume on the cluster, which is 
500 compute hours with the current configuration. But now I have actually significantly reduced the size of the input samples compared to the beginning, and this means that the current cluster size might actually be overproportional. And by reducing the cluster size, I can indeed very significantly reduce the resource consumption that I have while only slightly degrading execution time. So overall, the current configuration, the current plan, probably offers a better trade-off between different cost and quality metrics. So in summary, here we have choices related to join order, related to the execution platform, and related to sample sizes. And we compare different query plans according to the execution time, but also based on resource consumption and result completeness. And now you see that this scenario actually corresponds to a significant extension of classical query optimization, which is mostly about join order and execution time. Now, and I had to make many of those decisions actually by hand, basically in a trial and error approach. So it sometimes took a little bit of time, more time than I wanted to. It would have been good to have some query optimizer tool which takes as input the query and the description of the search space. And as output, it generates all alternative cost trade-offs that you can get for the given query. Or perhaps more precisely, I'm not interested in all cost trade-offs, but mainly in the Pareto optimal cost trade-offs for which no other plan has better cost according to all metrics. So having just the optimal trade-offs that would be sufficient. The problem is that uh, prior methods that existed at the start of my dissertation, they would have taken hours to optimize the query, a single query in that scenario. And part of the contribution in my dissertation was to make query optimization in those extended scenarios practical. And in order to do that, I have explored several high-level ideas. The first high-level idea being that we make optimization practical by moving it before runtime. And we can do that if we know that the queries we receive at runtime correspond to query templates that we know before runtime, because then we can calculate all potentially optimal plans in a pre-processing step. Another high-level idea to make query optimization more practical is to make it faster by relaxing optimality guarantees. I, for instance, work out approximation algorithms that find guaranteed near optimal solutions within seconds, the exhaustive optimization would take hours. I've also worked on increment, work out incremental algorithms that divide optimization into many small incremental steps and always give you formal bounds and how far you are from the optimal solutions at most. So you can decide yourself when you want to stop optimization. And finally, I've also worked out some randomized algorithms which don't give you thermal worst case guarantees on the quality of the solution, but they work well in average and they are significantly faster than all other methods. Yet another possibility to speed up optimization is to leverage novel optimization platforms. For instance, there are nowadays software solvers for many specific problem classes such as integer linear programming. And if we use one of those solvers as software platform for optimization, then we can often treat significantly larger queries than with traditional methods. Or yet another platform that we can leverage are massively parallel clusters, which we use nowadays anyway for data processing. So why shouldn't we use them for optimization as well? And in the following, I'm gonna present an approach for parallelizing query optimization over massive clusters. And finally, I'm also quickly going to talk a bit about my recent collaboration with NASA, <laughs> where I basically delivered a proof of concept that certain query optimization variants can be solved using a limited form of quantum computing. <clears throat> now, you can find more details in the corresponding uh, papers. In the following, I'm going to discuss in more detail how we can parallelize query optimization over large clusters. And more precisely, I'm going to talk about how we can parallelize perhaps the most popular algorithm for query optimization, which is based on dynamic programming. And in the following, I'm first of all going to give a quick overview of how that algorithm works. Now, um, in this example, I model query simply by a set of tables that need to be joined. So here we want to join tables R, S, and T. And 
using dynamic programming generally means that I solve a problem by decomposing it into subproblems. And in the case of queries, subproblems are subqueries. And with this simple query model, a subquery is simply a subset of tables to join. So first of all, the classical algorithm decomposes the input query into all the subqueries, and then it starts by treating the smallest subqueries. And for each subquery, it calculates all possible <laughs> query plans. Then it compares those plans based on the estimated execution time and only keeps the optimal plan for each of those subqueries. In the second stage, it uses those optimal plans for the smallest subqueries in, and combines them in order to generate plans for the larger queries. And then again, it compares those, diff those different plans according to the execution time and discards all plans except for the optimal plans. Until finally, we combine those results in order to create plans for the entire query. And there, we, set, we uh, again prune out suboptimal plans and finally obtain the optimal query plan for the entire query. Now, this is the algorithm for classical query optimization with one cost metric. <laughs> if I'm, for instance, in a cloud computing scenario, then I care not only about execution time, but also about monetary execution fees. But still I can use exactly the same dynamic programming scheme if I just keep all Pareto optimal plans for each of the subqueries instead of keeping only one optimal plan per subquery. Yes? That is absolutely one table, yes. And now you're wondering where the different plans come from, perhaps. Yes, the different plans come from the fact that you might have different index structures that you can decide to use or not to use. Or uh, in the case of approximate processing, you might, for instance, have different sample densities that you associate with one of those tables. So even for a single table, you already have different access factors. But it's a very good question. In each case, even if you are interested in multiple cost metrics, you can still use the same dynamic programming scheme, just that you keep uh, multiple Pareto optimal solutions for each of the subqueries. And now let's say that I don't have all information at query optimization time. That means that the cost of a query plan depends on an unknown parameter. And perhaps I'm interested in getting the optimal execution cost as a function of that parameter. In that scenario, I can still use the same dynamic programming scheme, just that this time I keep a cost function for each of those subqueries. We have seen that for many different query optimization variants, actually people use the same dynamic programming scheme. And that means that if you manage to parallelize that dynamic programming scheme, we immediately obtain parallel algorithms for most query optimization variants that have been proposed in the past 30 years. Now, one of the reasons why this has not happened uh, before is perhaps that query optimization had always the reputation of being difficult to parallelize. At least it said so in several recent publications on that topic. <clears throat> and in the following, I'm going to give you a little intuition for why it has the reputation of being difficult to parallelize. Here I'm drawing all subqueries for the example query joining five tables. And now I'm drawing dependencies between <laughs> them. If you need the result of one subquery, in order to calculate results for another subquery. And as you see here, intuitively those dependencies are quite dense. And that intuition can actually be formalized by saying that the dynamic programming scheme for query optimization belongs to the class of non-serial polyadic dynamic programming scheme, which generally have the reputation of being difficult to parallelize due to all those dependencies. And perhaps that is why prior attempts at parallelizing query optimization they are focused on the case where all optimizer threads run on the same machine and share the same memory. And on a high level, those approaches work as follows. The master obtains a query to optimize as input, and then the master assigns specific subqueries to specific workers and gives them the task to find optimal plans for those subqueries. And due to those dependencies that you've seen on the last slide, those different workers they have to heavily exchange intermediate results during optimization, which is, however, not that much of a problem since they share the same memory, so communication between them is relatively efficient. This has been tried out for up to four or maximum eight parallel optimizer threads. Now the question is, can we use that in order to exploit massive degrees of parallelism? <clears throat> First of all, 
If you have massive degrees of parallelism, hundreds or thousands of nodes, then typically we have a shared massing architecture. And this means that we have to assume that different optimizer threads run on different machines and that they have to communicate over the network. And now the traditional approach to parallelizing query optimization actually becomes problematic since, first of all, note that the number of subqueries grows exponentially in the input query size measured by the number of tables joined. And since the master assigns specific subqueries to specific workers, already we know that the time complexity on a master is exponential, so it might become the bottleneck. And on the other side, since those workers have heavily to exchange intermediate results, it means that we have an amount of network traffic that also grows exponentially in the input query size. And altogether, intuitively, it looks already like this approach works badly for massive degrees of parallelism. I've also implemented it using Spark, and I have tested uh, scalability in a large cluster with uh, more than 100 nodes. And on the x-axis, you see uh, how we de increase the degree of parallelism. And on the y-axis, you see optimization time. And now you actually see that precisely the opposite happens of what you want to happen. Because as we increase the degree of parallelism, optimization time actually increases as well, since the amount of network traffic increases with the number of workers. So this approach does not work in sharp nothing architectures. If you want to exploit massive degrees of parallelism, then we have to do it quite differently. The traditional approach at parallelizing query optimization decomposes the problem at a relatively fine-grained granularity, the granularity of single subquests. Now, our approach here is kind of the opposite, since we decompose the problem in the most coarse-grained manner that is possible. In our approach, the master obtains a query's input, and then the master sends only that query together with a plan space partition ID to each of the workers. Then each worker independently searches the optimal plan in its associated plan space partition, and after finding it, it returns it to the master, and then master just has to compare one plan returned by each worker in order to determine the globally <coughs> optimal plan. <coughs> And as you see, we don't have any communication between different workers. So intuitively, if you use that approach, then we have polynomial complexity on the master and a polynomial amount of network traffic. So it should work very well. But the problem is, of course, how can we decompose the plan space into different equal-sized partitions such that different workers don't have to coordinate and don't have to exchange intermediate results during optimization? And in the following, I'm going to show how we can achieve that. <clears throat> Let's first of all focus on the case of left deep query plans. I have mentioned left deep query plans before. In general, a left deep query plan can be represented by a left deep binary tree, so the right join operand is always a single table. And for left deep query plans, we actually can characterize a query plan simply by an order between tables in which they are joined. Now, a first naive way of decomposing the plan space would be the following. I can simply fix for each of the workers the first table in that join order. And if I have five partitions, then I cover the entire plan space for a query with five tables. And the example plan that you see here would be in the second partition since we start joining by table S. <clears throat> Now I assume that on each of the worker nodes, we run the classical dynamic programming algorithm. So time complexity on the workers will be somewhat proportional to the number of subqueries they consider. <clears throat> and here you see all the subqueries for the example query. However, a single worker does not have to treat all of those subqueries since it only treats a plan space partition. And more precisely, each worker only has to consider those subqueries which correspond to intermediate results that could be generated during the execution of a plan in its associated plan space partition. And here on top, I draw in red the different intermediate results that are generated during the execution of the example plan. And you might notice <coughs> that in each of those intermediate results, table S appears. And this is not a coincidence since this plan belongs into the second plan space partition where we start joining with S, 
And this means that S has to be included in each intermediate result uh, of the plans in that partition. And this means that the worker treating partition S does not have to consider any subqueries which do not contain table S. And therefore we can strike out the corresponding subqueries. <clears throat> Now this means that if we exploit a degree of parallelism that is proportional to the number of tables, then we can divide execution time by two. Now, that's a relatively moderate decrease of execution time, of course, or optimization time, uh, more precisely. Let's see how we can do better than that. We can do better than that by using a different type of constraints. Now I'm using constraints that refer to pairs of tables. Here, for instance, tables R and S, and I can decompose the plan space based on whether table R appears before table S or whether it's the other way around. <clears throat> and in case of the example plan, since table S appears directly before table R in the joint order, reading from left to right, uh, it means that it is in the right partition. And now let's see which subqueries we can eliminate based on this constraint on the joint order. Now, if table S appears before table R, then we can never have a subquery containing table R, but not table S. And this means that we can get rid of all subqueries containing R, but not S, which asymptotically is one quarter of all subqueries. And we can recursively continue the decomposition of the plan space by considering a new pair of tables, let's say T and U, and uh, partitioning the plan space based on which of those tables appears first. And in case of the example plan, table U appears before table T, so it would actually be in the rightmost plan space partition. And if table U appears before table T, <coughs> we cannot have table T without table U, and therefore we can eliminate the corresponding subqueries. So each time that we double the degree of parallelism, we reduce optimization time by a factor three quarters, which is already much better than before, but for the moment, we are still restricted to left deep query plan, which is only a subclass of the possible query plans. Let's see how we can generalize that in order to treat Bushy query plans. A Bushy query plan in this simple model is simply a binary tree. And that means in particular that we cannot characterize a plan anymore based on an order between tables, because here we don't have an order between tables anymore. So the question is, can we use a trick in order to get back to an ordering between tables. And we can do that as follows. If you fix one of those tables, like R in this example, and we say that we only consider the path from a table R to the root of the query plan tree. And now we can only consider the intermediate results that appear on the path from R to the root, and we can order the other tables besides R based on the order in which they appear on that path. So I can use constraints that refer to table triples, where the first part of the constraint fixes the table whose paths we are considering, while the second part of the constraint orders two of the other tables. And in case of, of the example plan, if you follow R to the if you follow the path from R to the root, then we see that table U appears um, actually before table T and therefore it is in the left partition. And now let's reason again about which subqueries we can eliminate based on that constraint. Well, first of all, since we only consider intermediate results that appear on the path from R to the root, it is clear that we have to focus our attention on those subqueries which contain R when eliminating subqueries. And due to the second part of the constraint, we can exclude all subqueries which contain T but not table U. And wherever those two conditions intersect, we can get rid of the corresponding subqueries, which asymptotically means that we get rid of one out of eight subqueries. So each time that we double the degree of parallelism, and of course we can recursively continue the decomposition of the plan space as before if we select a new triple of tables, and each time that we do that and double the degree of parallelism, the number of subqueries per worker is multiplied by factor 7 divided by 8. However, here I'm writing that time complexity is actually multiplied by factor 21 divided by 27. And now you might be wondering how I come to that specific factor. Well, 
First of all, before I said that time complexity on the workers is proportional to the number of subqueries they need to consider. But in case of Bushy query plans, that's actually a simplification. Because in case of Bushy query plans, for each subquery, I need to try out all possibilities of decomposing that subquery into two join operands. And in this example, I'm drawing all subqueries, and in green, I'm drawing all subquery splits we need to consider. And intuitively, we see, of course, there are more, sub more subquery splits than subqueries. And if we do the math, then the number of subquery splits also grows much faster than the number of subqueries. And this means that in order to get time complexity for Bushy query plans, we actually have to count the number of subquery splits that we are considering. <clears throat> now, if I have, if I consider one specific table, then I can partition the subquery splits into three groups based on whether that table appears in the left joint operand, in the right joint operand, or in none of them. <clears throat> now I have constraints that refer to triples of tables, so if I have three possibilities for each table, in total I have three to the power three makes 27 possibilities. So I can partition all subquery splits we consider into 27 groups based on whether specific tables appear in the left or in the right joint operand or in none of them. And here I have symbolized those 27 groups of subquery splits uh, for the three tables R, T, and U. And uh, in the following, we are going to count how many of those subquery splits we can eliminate based on the example constraint on the bottom. <clears throat> Due to the first part of the constraint, I already know that I have to focus on those subquery splits whose joint result contains table R, since we are following R to the root of the joint tree. And due to the second part of the constraint, I know that I cannot have T without U. And if I check the joint results in those subquery splits, then based on the second part of the constraint, I can already eliminate four of them. But I should not only check the join results, I should also check the join operands, and more precisely, I should check those join operands which contain table R. And now, again, applying the second part of the constraint, I can exclude two more of those subquery splits, which means that in general, we get rid of six out of 27 cases, and that leads to the factor that I have shown before. Now, based on those insights, I have uh, analyzed the complexity of the algorithm in terms of the complexity on the master, the amount of network traffic and the complexity on the worker nodes. And you already see in those formulas appearing the factors that we have justified before. And on a high level, those complexity results actually represent precisely what you want to happen. Because polynomial complexity on the master and the amount of network traffic is also polynomial. So the only exponential complexity is on the worker nodes, which means that we have moved complexity exactly where we want it to be because on the worker, it will be reduced via parallelization. <clears throat> and perhaps you might also be wondering whether we can get perhaps better reduction factors uh, if we divide the problem differently. But in the paper, we are able to show that at least for a limited class of decomposition methods, those reduction factors are actually the optimum of what you can get. Now, I've also implemented that approach using Spark and tested scalability in a large cluster. And now you see we have pretty much what we want, and if we increase the degree of parallelism, then optimization time steadily is reduced. The only limitation is that for small queries, you only can exploit a limited degree of parallelism since you need to uh, add constraints on disjoint table sets. But that's not so critical, it seems, because small queries, you don't need parallelization anyway. And those are results for classical query optimization. We can do precisely the same thing for multi-objective query optimization with multiple cost metrics. And again, we see the same tendencies. So we can use that approach in general to exploit massive degrees of parallelism, which I believe is important since nowadays we have those massive degrees of parallelism anyway for executing queries. So we should have a way of also using that for optimization. Now, the next thing that I want to discuss uh, is my recent work on uh, using a limited form of quantum computing for certain query optimization variants. I mean, on a high level, you know that there's currently certain difficulties in improving 
conventional computers. You have probably already heard about the end of Moore's law and, for instance, standard scaling, which predicts that computers become more energy efficient at exponential rates, also has ended a couple of years ago. So it generally makes sense to think already a bit about what other computing technologies one could use in order to complement conventional computers in certain areas. <clears throat> and one promising candidate for the moment, even if uh, it's uh, more of a long-term perspective, seems to be quantum computing. And on a very high level, we can say that a quantum computer differs from a conventional computer because quantum computers operate on qubits while conventional computers operate on bits. And the specific thing about qubits is that they can be in multiple states at the same time that would be considered mutually exclusive according to the laws of classical physics, but they are allowed according to the laws of quantum physics. And with a highly simplifying intuition, you can imagine that being in multiple states at the same time allows a certain kind of parallelization that is uh, not possible <coughs> on classical computers. Now, quantum computing has been a purely theoretical research area until quite recently. And now, since a couple of years, there's a couple of uh, tries to actually implement quantum computing. Just a couple of uh, weeks ago, Google released a paper in which they described uh, experiments that they, uh, that they performed with a recently developed device that uses a, a quantum, a, a limited form of quantum computing. The device I was using is the one you see here in the picture. It was also paid for by Google, but it's actually produced by the Canadian company D-Wave and it's currently hosted at NASA in California. And if you would open up that device, then you would see uh, qubits, uh, which are realized by tiny metal loops and they are connected via so-called couplings, uh, they are connected pairwise in a very specific connection structure that's also called the Timera graph. And since uh, this whole circuit is made out of niobium, if you cool it down to a temperature of around 15 millikelvin, then you actually can have, it becomes superconducting and you basically can have current flowing in multiple directions at the same time. And this is what allows to represent a superposition. At least that's the theory. Now, this device has been very controversially discussed over the past years. And here I've added a couple of comments from some famous people in the field. Uh, in particular, I have added comments from Scott Arison, who is a famous uh, professor for quantum computing, and he is known to be very critical towards that uh, machine. And when I actually started working with that, the discussion was still ongoing about whether the machine actually deserves to tag quantum computer or not. So whether those quantum effects really play a significant role during the computation. And um, now there has been some recent experimental results which actually show that uh, quantum effects play indeed a significant role. And as you can say, <clears throat> since recently it also convinced uh, Scott Aronson, so in total nowadays there seems to be a consensus between uh, uh, people in the field that there is at least a limited form of quantum uh, computation present. Yes? So is there controversy that I mean, uh, that was not the problem of the discussion. I mean, <clears throat> this machine obviously, I mean, uh, we have people have access to that, people from NASA, people from Google had access to the machine, so it's not like there could be something completely different uh, in it than they claim. So the problem was more like, uh, even if you have a machinery that can uh, be in a superposition in principle, the question is, does this happen sufficiently for a, for, for a sufficiently long time to play a significant role during the computation? Because it's actually very difficult to shield those circuits from disturbances from the outside. And they're, they're, doing, they're making a great effort in order to shield it. They're putting it into a vacuum. They're cooling it down to extreme temperatures. They have electromagnetic shields. But still, you do have disturbances from the outside. And now the question whether quantum effects actually play a significant role in the computation already requires you to estimate how long those quantum effects can persist before they get destroyed, for instance. And it's those questions that those experiments have been uh, focusing on. Um, those 
last experiments basically that uh, I mentioned, uh, for instance, they basically compare uh, this uh, machine against uh, a classic computer in how quickly it solves certain classes of problems. And from optimization, uh, you probably know that if you have a cost function where you have a local optimum close to a global optimum and they are separated by a steep hill, then often classical approaches have troubles finding that global optimum. Like classical approaches like simulated anemia, for instance. So here on the y-axis you have the cost function and on the x-axis you have the search space. And they basically made experiments where they increase the height of that hill uh, consecutively and then they compare the success probability of uh, that machine against a classical computer. And the advantage of uh, quantum computing is that it allows you basically to tunnel through that barrier in certain conditions, so it should have less troubles with high hills. And they were basically making a case that the results uh, seem to uh, quite convincingly point out that the machine actually uh, uses uh, quantum effects uh, in a significant uh, amount, basically. And as you say, as you see, uh, for instance, Scott Aronson also uh, seems to be convinced by those uh, results. But this is only about the question whether it actually deserves to tag limited form of quantum computing. It's definitely not a universal quantum computer. You cannot run Shor's algorithm for vectorizing prime numbers on it, for instance, but a limited form of quantum computing. And now the focus of the discussion is more shifting towards the question saying, okay, even if you have a limited form of quantum computing, is this actually better than classical computers? And the discussion on that is currently ongoing. And one question raised by several of those people is in particular, how does it actually perform for practically relevant problems? Because the machine itself only supports a very restrictive input format. And this means that for most practically relevant problems, you first have to transform them into that restrictive input format. And this transformation can lead to huge overheads. And now, uh, my paper in that space uh, contributes a bit to that discussion <coughs> since I have basically shown how to solve a classical database-related optimization problem on a machine. And this classical problem is called multiple query optimization, where you have a batch of multiple queries and you want to minimize their aggregated execution cost. And those different uh, queries, the plans for different queries actually can uh, overlap work. So uh, if you overlap work between different queries, then you can save execution cost. <clears throat> the main contribution in the paper is actually about how we can achieve this transformation from that problem into the input format required by the machine. Here I'm only giving a very high level overview of that transformation. And the first step of that transformation actually takes an instance of the multiple query optimization problem and translates it into a quadratic formula that depends on binary variables because the machine basically minimizes uh, quadratic formulas and binary variables. Those binary variables select, uh, they represent a selection of different query plans, while the quadratic formula contains terms representing the execution cost of single plans, the cost savings by overlapping work between different plans, as well as problem constraints, such as the constraint that uh, I have to uh, execute one plan for each of the queries in the batch. But this first transformation step is only part of the transformation. In the second step, I have to map each of the variables that appears in this formula to a group of qubits that will represent them. And uh, this mapping has to satisfy various constraints. First of all, uh, all qubits representing the same variable need to be connected in this uh, connection structure. And, and uh, also, if two variables appear together in a product in that quadratic formula, their qubits also need to be connected. So finding uh, a mapping that complies with those constraints is actually in general an NP-hard problem, but for the specific case of multiple query optimization, we were able to work out an efficient transformation. <clears throat> we have evaluated our approach in comparison to uh, classical computers, and um, as you see here, if the problems map very well to the input format that is required by the uh, quantum uh, machine, meaning that 
the number of qubits that we need to represent a single problem variable is relatively close to the theoretical optimum of one, then we can get some impressive speed ups, but as soon as those problems map less conveniently to the machine, those speed ups get reduced uh, relatively quickly. We can find more details in the corresponding paper. And uh, now, um, do I still have time? Okay, then I'm quickly going to give an overview of the project at Google that I initially used as motivating example. Um, in this project, the goal was to support uh, Google queries where users use subjective predicates. And therefore, we wanted to find out which subjective properties people uh, intuitively associate to certain entities, because this allows us to better understand those queries. In order to find that out, we used uh, natural language analysis in order to mine statements from the web where users e express an opinion about whether or not a specific property applies to a specific entity. Now we can collect all opinions that refer to the same entity property combination and perhaps you think that now we are already done because we can just take the majority vote for each of those entity property combinations. But doing so actually works surprisingly badly. <clears throat> the reason is that when users post things on the web, then they are subject to various types of skews. To name just one example, users who think that a certain uh, city is big, they are more likely to mention it in their blogs, and therefore they will always be overrepresented in our opinion sample. And in order to overcome those skews, we learn entity type and property specific user behavior models by a completely unsupervised approach. And those models actually help us to interpret the collected opinions quite reliably. <clears throat> we have run this uh, on a large snapshot of the entire web and we were able to extract over 4 billion entity property combinations. And we have of course compared the quality of the output by a large user study. And um, we compared against prior approaches, state-of-the-art approaches for information extraction. But as you see, we can very significantly improve precision and recall at the same time. And in our more detailed experiments, we show that this is mostly due to the fact that we learn uh, those user behavior models. So here we are dealing with subjective properties, so interpreting the collective opinions is actually more challenging than for objective properties, and here in this paper uh, we can find more details about uh, how we actually achieve that. Now I'm very quickly going to uh, mention uh, two or three things that I'm currently working on. Um, first of all, I'm currently working on a problem that is complementary to query optimization, which is selectivity estimation which basically is about predicting uh, which percentage of the data will satisfy a certain group of predicates. And you might be wondering uh, whether it's a niche problem or whether it's an important problem, but it turns out that we actually need selectivity estimation in order to estimate the cardinality of intermediate results that occur during data processing. And that is crucial in order to estimate the cost of alternative uh, query plans. And uh, that again is the base for query optimization, but not only for query optimization, also for making decisions like how to partition data or which index structures to create or how to design your schemata. You always need a way of comparing execution cost of different alternatives. And all of those things are actually what makes database systems self-managing and declarative. So selectivity estimation is actually the very fundament of some properties that are fundamental for database systems. And it turns out that in this whole stack, selectivity estimation is actually one of the most challenging problems because people have shown that if you have reliable selectivity estimation, then, estimation, then estimated cost, for instance, would not be a problem at all. But the challenge is really to get selectivity estimation right. And for that reason, there has been, for instance, a recent manifesto by um, a guy who is famous in databases and he is at the same time he was the lead architect of the IBM uh, DB2 optimizer. And he really made the case that the 
entire community should focus much more on the selectivity estimation problem because this is a problem that people have been working on since decades, but still it is not solved and it is crucial in practice. And I believe that now there might be some opportunities to finally make progress there by using machine learning methods in order to predict a selectivity that are trained and carefully selected data samples. And yet another thing that I'm currently working on relates to natural language query interfaces. We have nowadays, since recently, database systems that actually talk to the user. You can also input your queries via voice. I have, for instance, tried out a system at this year's SIGMOD, which was based on Amazon's speech recognition system that you see on the bottom of the slide. And um, so while it works in principle, I think that there's many interesting challenges to overcome before this really becomes practical. One of the first challenges in that space already, how do I actually read out the result of a query? Current systems would just read out one row after the other one, basically. But you can imagine that this quickly gets too long. So you probably want to think about how you can somehow summarize the output and probably there are different ways of doing that which come with different trade-offs and another possibility is that you want to somehow approximate the query results in order to achieve a shorter output or maybe you want to refer to some results that the user has seen before in order to reduce speaking time. Another challenge of course relates to how can we make querying more intuitive. For the moment those query languages are basically like pretty much like speaking SQL queries. And SQL is not a really nat natural language to speak, obviously. So you might want to use machine learning in order to find ways to uh, allow more colloquial queries for users. But for long and complex queries, that might actually still not be natural. So you might want to think about how we can make those interfaces uh, conversational and decompose queries and results into a dialogue between the user and the database system. And uh, if we have, for instance, some information about what queries people typically ask on a certain database, then we can use that knowledge in order to optimize the length and the efficiency of that dialogue. So I think there's like several interesting challenges. Working on in a very high level, I would say that most of those projects actually aim finally at making data analysis more efficient and more user-friendly. The methods that I use in order to achieve that are quite diverse, in particular from the area of artificial intelligence. And if you find any of those projects interesting, then please don't hesitate to talk to me. And now I look forward to your question. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Yes. So can you say why uh, selectivity estimation is a difficult, difficult problem? Because of two things, because of black box predicates and because of correlation. Now, predicates, if they are simple predicates like a linear inequality, you might be able to estimate selectivity based on the statistics that you have on the data. But nowadays, you often have predicates that actually hide user-defined functions. So those predicates are actually too complex to analyze. So they're pretty much black boxes from the optimizer perspective, at least when seeing it for the first time. So that's the first problem when estimating the selectivity of a single predicate. But even more importantly, and this is a problem that people have since decades, uh, even if you can estimate the selectivity of single predicates, you still don't know what will be the aggregate selectivity of a whole group of predicates because there might be correlations between those different predicates. And you cannot keep statistics for each possible predicate combination. So in that case, it becomes very problematic to estimate selectivity. And many of the examples that I mentioned this manifesto about how everyone should work on selectivity estimation now, many of those examples actually refer to problems that are based on correlations. Yes. Uh, have you compared running your uh, your optimization methods on the D Wave and on optimized classical hardware? Well, the thing is, uh, we have uh, compared against the commodity computer. There, uh, the purpose of that evaluation was basically to bound 
how much do we lose by this transformation overhead? It might first seem like it's a non-interesting comparison actually, but because we have all this transformation overhead, it's actually a priori very unclear whether uh, even a commodity computer can be beaten or not. There's also lots of other papers that uh, present results uh, for uh, comparing against like more powerful hardware architecture. So here we use a commodity computer and the results that we've seen, this refers to the best algorithm out of a set of uh, four or five algorithms where we use the most typical algorithms for multiple query optimization, including like uh, integer programming, quadratic programming, uh, but also genetic algorithms, uh, heuristics, uh, using uh, linear programming, but only in order to obtain approximate results. So we tried out many different variants of that. Yeah. Who was first? Okay. Uh, do your insights into these like parallel algorithms from three algorithms, do they transfer to other areas of like algorithms or theories? Actually, I just uh, come from the VDB conference where I presented that paper. And uh, several people approached me and kind of encouraged me to look at whether it can be applied for other problems as well. So this is something that I definitely want to look at. For the moment, I haven't thought about it uh, much. Yeah. But it makes sense, definitely. Yeah. It's good if you say a little bit more about smart sampling, specifically how, this, um, how you can do something, how much information about your world data set and your subsequent queries. Right. OK. When I select those data samples in order to make a selectivity estimation, you mean? Right. Uh, so, I mean, this is something that I'm currently working on. So I'm considering different methods. I mean, in general, in machine learning, you have, for instance, those approaches related to so-called active learning, which means that I have a certain set of uh, unlabeled samples, and then the machine learning method decides automatically which of those samples should get labeled next. And in the context of selectivity estimation, an unlabeled sample could be a combination of predicates that you feel that you don't know much about. And then evaluating labeling that could be to uh, evaluate that group of predicates on a small data sample, for instance. There's also approaches from reinforcement learning, which also aim at like uh, optimizing uh, the effort you invest into uh, getting information, basically. So there are several existing approaches I'm currently evaluating which of them might be most suitable for that problem. Yeah. Very good question. I have my lecture at uh, 125. Yeah, okay. So we would still have time, but... Thank you. Thank you. Hear yourself.